Hey everybody, this is Brent from Wolf on Wall Street Trade. Soon we are going to have a new website, so it won't be called that anymore. I will fill you in on the new website, but we're going to have a chat room, trading room for members, a lot of other stuff. If you're a current member, you are going to be locked in, grandfathered in at the 2008 price, because I have not changed my prices since 2008. But when the new website goes live, it's going to be a little bit more. So if you're interested in checking out the content, check it out for a month. Subscribe now and you'll be locked in at those rates before the new website goes live. So we're looking at the S&P 500 and boy, has it been a snooze fest. So 30 minute chart. These are weeks. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six weeks trading in a range. Mostly that is about two and a quarter percent couple little moves here outside and inside, but it's been a very dull market. A lot of this was earnings season, and earnings season tends to do that. Wait until you see the summer earnings season, Q2 earnings, it's usually even duller. But point is, if we look at these, the S&P 500 is kind of in this rectangle. This is not the strongest bullish pattern. It's the weakest bullish pattern. The only way it gets its bullish bias is this preceding uptrend. But this is kind of like a battle between the bulls and bears in very low conviction. So the bulls buying here, the bears selling up here. Six weeks, not a lot of conviction, but you can see the difference in the other markets. We'll leave this on the same time frame. Just look at the Dow. See, the S&P um, is right here in the middle of the range. It caught support on Friday at 4,100. So that's kind of an interesting level. We thought it would catch support there. It did. If you look at the Dow, a little bit weaker. It's kind of trading at the bottom of this range. I haven't liked the Dow since we first went bullish on the market in October of last year uh, when the Dow did lead the rally. You look at NASDAQ 100, that is what we've been bullish on in 2023 year to date. And the reason why is expected the mega caps to rotate in to a position of leadership, which they did January 1st. So you can see it's trading a little bit above this range. It's looking a lot better than the other averages. For a lot of people, this market is very confusing. And believe me, I watch the market all day, every day. I missed one day this week because I was horribly sick. I usually don't miss any days. And it felt like the next day I had to like spend a lot of time to figure out where we were again. If you're not catching the tone of the market every single day, you're missing a lot of little things, changes in character. And that was what um, some recent videos and live streams have been about changes in character precede changes in trend. So the market will give you a lot of hints of what it's going to do next, but you really have to dig out those hints. You have to pay attention. So taking a quick look at the S&P, and this is a daily chart. You can see the time frame up here. So we were in a bear market, kind of expected that late 2021 because of a lot of different things. But in any case, we were in a primary downtrend. About August, I started to see what I would call a change in trend or change in character. You can see that instead of making higher or lower highs, lower lows, we started to make a higher high over here. So into this low in October, we were looking for bases. A lot of bases formed, but this is no longer a primary downtrend. So we've had the Fed hike nine times since March. Uh, that's about 500, 525 basis points. And you have the S&P that's only about 14% off its record high. What we saw and what the call was around August into September was that we would see this primary downtrend turn into an intermediate lateral trend, not just a bear market rally like this. It's probably a little bit more visible on small caps chart. You can see here's the primary downtrend or the bear market. And here is this lateral trending market. You can kind of almost draw a square right in here. So lateral intermediate trend. I do expect that we are going to resume that bear market at some point, and I think we're getting kind of closer. Uh, if you're a subscriber, you know exactly where I think we are. But it hasn't just been knowing where the market is going to go. So say from this primary downtrend to an intermediate lateral trend, it has been knowing where to be in the market. So our first call, my first call, was the Dow over here in October and small caps to some extent. That was my second favorite. The reason why, they had stronger bases. So here's that daily chart of the Dow and you can see like a little W bottom right there in October. Small caps had the same thing. 
So the call was Dow, uh, Dow and small caps to outperform on this first leg, and that's what happened. I'm going to zoom in a little bit closer. And if we just take like a little measurement from this October low to the Dow's November high, it was just a little bit above 20%, and then everybody was starting to talk about, are we in a new bull market in Dow? Go back and look at my videos. I addressed this specifically in, I think it was uh, late November or December, that no, we are not in a bull market. This is what we expected, but to remain in this lateral trend. So the Dow has done nothing since then. If we look at it from here to about Friday's close, down 3.65%. The next call was that mega caps would rotate in and they would take over leadership. So what's driven most by the mega caps? What indice? That would be the NASDAQ 100. And it was the worst performing in 2022. But as we got into January over here, watch what happens. So if we do it on like a year to date basis, 22%, right? Now let's look at the Dow. Actually, I'm going to put this on year to date and then we'll take a look. It'll be easier. Okay, so still a daily chart, but I just moved it to year to date. Let's look at the SP 500, which is going to benefit more um, than something like small caps from mega cap leadership, but not as much as the NASDAQ 100. So if we look at this year to date, and we'll see what the gain is so far 7.4%. Not bad. Not bad. Let's take a look at the Dow. Remember, I thought the Dow was going to lead the first leg, but I didn't think it was going to do much after that. So on a year-to-date basis, uh, let's see, we'll take it from, I think, yeah, right over here. On a year-to-date basis, the Dow was not the place to be, right? A half a percent gain. But we look at the NASDAQ 100, which was the call that mega caps would rotate into leadership. We get a pretty nice boom. 22% gain year to date. So it's not just about knowing what the market's going to do next, broadly speaking, but where to be in the market, whether it's going to be cyclical stocks, uh, secular growth, whatever. That's really what's important because if you had it right and you said, look, I think the market is going to go sideways, bounce a little bit, the Dow would have been the place to be from October to November, but it would have done you no good at all in 2023. So you got the market right, but you're in the wrong place. How do I determine what I think is going to perform best? And it's usually on a quarter basis, you know, hedge funds, institutional funds usually reallocate and reposition on a quarterly basis. But it is what I call changes in character. And changes in character always precede changes in trends. But these changes in character are like digging out little hidden secrets. You really have to watch the market carefully. I watch way more than just the stock market, the bond market, currencies, commodities, rates, everything tells me something. And believe me, there are some big funds like Ray Dalio's Bridgewater that are very well respected. They have a lot of very smart people. They got it wrong. So in 2022, they were set for a bear market. They were set for rising rates, all that stuff. They did great until we got into that October period where the market rallied and went into this intermediate lateral trend. They lost almost all of their year-to-date gains just because they missed that one rally. So what is the market telling us now? I want to show you something a little bit different. It's pretty bland, but it'll give you kind of an idea. And I've switched over to StockFinder. This orange line is my 3C indicator. It's a money flow indicator um, that I wrote. And we're looking at SPY. And what I just want to show you real quick is Friday, we were coming down on some debt ceiling concerns and the market was coming into, the S&P was coming to this 4,100 area that I thought would hold. So I just want to show you this real quick because it's kind of interesting. And this is just a real short term one minute chart. And this is Friday's open for the SPY. You can see 3C over here is not having it it's negatively diverging but we come into that s p 4100 level in the afternoon and 3c is positively diverging in addition to that short covering right there at 4100 i'll show you that real quick and this time we're looking at the s p 500 this is still friday this white line is my most shorted index of stock so you can see as the s p comes into 4100 right over here 
we start to see short covering and we also see 3C showing some buying at that 4100 level. So level to keep in mind. It's not a huge one, but on a short term basis, something to keep in mind. So let me go back to what I wanted to show you. And what this is, is the S&P 500 from the October low over here. And the white line is just an equal weighted index of the pro-cyclical S&P sectors. So you can see they actually lead the market higher. Oop, uh, let me get a drawing tool here. Right over here, you can see they positively diverge. S&P is making a new low. They're diverging higher. The cyclical sectors, they're leading this rally. This is where the Dow did really well. Here we come into February. A lot of hot inflation data caused this deeper pullback. So to keep this rally going, we need to make a higher high, so above 4,200. But you can see what is happening with these cyclical sectors. They're really starting to underperform. If you've heard any of my videos, I've been talking about three phases. For instance, phase one was this rally on expectations of peak Fed hawkishness. And eventually, when we get there, it becomes a sell the news event. I do believe we are there, and I do believe we're getting close to that sell the news event. Phase two is the market starts worrying more about recession after the Fed hiked 500 plus basis points in a year. And you can see that with these weaker cyclical sectors that do well when the economy is expanding or we're in a, the start of a new economic cycle, but they don't do well when we are going into a recession. So phase two, this is one of the reasons I think that we are starting to see some of that. And let me show you a couple other groups. And again, we're looking at the same thing, S&P 500 from the October lows where this rally began. And these are the counter cyclicals or the defensive sectors. They're kind of bond proxies, uh, consumer staples, utilities, stuff like that that tends to do a little bit better in a recessionary environment because you still have to buy toilet paper. You still have to buy food, stuff like that. So consumer staples, but they are not a group that's going to lead a rally. It's usually going to be the cyclicals or the secular growth, but even the defensives are not acting as well. You can see over here, this is why we're seeing market breadth. That was phenomenal right up to here. Really starting to decline. Maybe we'll have time to show you that. Let me show you one last group. And these are an equal weighted index of mega cap stocks. It's my own little index of just mega cap stocks, but it's equally weighted. So you can see in the end of 2022, they were being sold off hard. They were not good performers. So a lot of tax loss selling, stuff like that into December. But as soon as we come into January, major, major outperformance. I'm going to zoom in a little bit. So what I've done is zoomed right into 2023. This is January 3rd, the first trading day of 2023. And you can see these mega caps rotate in and they take over the role of leadership. So I did expect market breadth to weaken because money was going to move out of the cyclicals. It was going to rotate into these mega caps. They're very heavily weighted. So a dozen of them, half dozen of them, even Apple can move the entire market. Whereas the cyclicals, you need pretty much the whole sector to lead. But as more money goes into these, money's coming out of the cyclicals, the defensives, and market breadth starts to get weaker. That leads to eventually a more fragile market that can crack really fast, really unexpectedly. But the point here is even where we are right now, where they haven't had the same degree of strength as they did in Q1 or actually January, they're still leading and they're still hanging in there. As a matter of fact, let me show you a chart that I highlighted for our subscribers Tuesday morning. And we're back to a 60-minute chart here. This is the S&P. I'm going to jump to that stock. It was Alphabet. So this was a very bullish price pattern. It's called an ascending triangle. And basically what you have here is a zone of supply or resistance where sellers are coming in. But you have this lower trend line that's moving up. That means an ascending triangle. Okay, you can see it. Usually they break out, if they're strong, about two thirds of the way to the apex. If you were to extend these lines, that's the apex. This is about where it was Tuesday morning when I highlighted it. 
And if we move forward to the rest of the week, there it is, nice breakout for Google. And even on Friday when mega caps were kind of out of favor, not too bad, but a little bit out of favor, it acted really well with this small little bullish consolidation. So the mega caps are still in a leadership role. And I still think the S&P 500 can probably trade above 4,200. But I do think at that point, you're going to start seeing smart money selling into those price gains. That is distribution. That's what we see on 3C. And I'll show you that in a minute. But what I want to show you first is the most influential S&P sector by weight. That's the technology sector. Let me go to a two hour chart because you'll really see the change in character as we come into the new year, January. Big bull flag breakout, another bull flag. It's breaking out. So if we look at the measured move, let me go a little bit closer to 30 minute chart. And this is the measured move, this vertical line that I'm going to place right at the breakout. And I'm going to just bring this down. So it comes in around 160 for the tech sector. But if we look at a daily chart, what you'll see at 160 is we're going to face some heavier, heavier resistance over there back up just a little bit we're going to come right into um, this zone over here much heavier resistance in that area as we start to meet those measured moves so i think the leadership in the mega caps has a little bit more to go which means the market probably has a little bit more to go but it's going to become increasingly difficult as we get into like this gap over here and this overhead supply even over here you know we're seeing resistance so I don't think it's as bullish, definitely not as bullish as we were on it coming into the new year 2023. But even on a very dull week like this week, SP 500, I think it was up uh, about three tenths of a, down three tenths of a percent. You can see it right here. So if we look at the mega cap index, and I just use MGK to be consistent, you can use whatever you want, but I would advise being consistent on the week up. 80 basis points. We compare that to the S&P equal weighted index on the week down 110 basis points. So effectively mega caps outperforming by 190 basis points. It's not always about being in something that's going to move up. It's sometimes about, especially if you're a fund that you have to be invested, something that is not going to move down or is not going to move down as much Anyway, the point being, even on a very dull week where the S&P is down three tenths of a percent, we still see that leadership in the mega caps. So phase one was the rally. Let me zoom in a little bit closer. Was the rally on the expectation that we hit peak rates and peak Fed hawkishness. That doesn't mean a pivot. That just means that step down from 75 to 50 basis points and we've had that rally which has created that kind of lateral trend in some of the averages like I pointed out earlier IWM small caps um, the next thing that I was looking for was that becomes a sell the event news I have been saying for a couple weeks now that I think the Fed just pulled off its last rate hike and it is done I'll show you why and if you've caught my live streams over the last couple weeks I've been talking about this a lot. I've been showing it a lot. I've shown the history of it. What we have here is the Fed funds rate in blue, okay? And the uh, red line is the two-year yield. This gray is recession shading. So that is the COVID crash of Q1 2020. So what happens is historically, more often than not, when the bond market or the two-year yield crosses below the Fed funds rate in a rate hike cycle, the Fed is done. So here you see a rate hike cycle, you see the two year cross below, you see the Fed pause and then start cutting rates. We're at that point now. I had to draw on this line because for some reason the St. Louis Fed did not update uh, this chart. But five to 5.25 is the Fed funds rate. We have the four year, or I'm sorry, the two year yield that has crossed below that. Historically, that means they are done. We got some more evidence of this week. Let me show you that. And what this is, is just a tweet from a Wall Street Journal guy named Nick Timiraos. He is known as the Fed Whisperer or Nicky Leaks. So when the Fed wants to get something out, say they're in the blackout period, media blackout, and they can't adjust expectations for what they're going to do at the meeting, but something's changed, they usually leak it to this guy. So this week, May 10th, you can see on his tweet, 
A summer break from rate hikes appears likely. Where do you think he got that? Mm, okay. Here is his article in the Wall Street Journal. Summer break appears likely as Fed officials monitor the effects of the banking stress. Okay. So the bond market was already telling us that. Now we're hearing it from the Fed whisperer. I think the Fed is done. In my whole um, outline of phase one, phase two, phase three, for my members, what we expect, I think we're late phase one, which means at some point we're going to be selling this news of the Fed pausing. It is not as bullish as you might think. Back in 2021, when the Fed was still saying that inflation was likely transitory, I was telling my subscribers, the Fed is going to hike rates. They are going to purposefully engineer a recession to kill inflation. So if the Fed is worried about one thing more than the other, they're much more worried about inflation, much harder to fight than a recession. The only thing they're worried about more than inflation would be the financial system having a crisis, the plumbing of the financial system breaking down. And we've kind of been getting some hints of that, right? If you've been paying attention to the regional banks, and this is KRE, so it's an ETF for the regional banks, they have been getting hammered since SVB. Then we had FCT, and now PacWest is looking like it's in trouble, but let's just take a quick measurement. It's gonna be a little bit random, but it'll give you a rough idea down over 50% from the highs where we have the broader market down just 14% or so. So do I think that's the only reason the Fed is going to end the rate hike cycle? No, I don't. I also think that we'll be moving into recession the sec probably the second half of this year. That's been my call since last year that um, 2H, we move into recession. I'll show you why real quick. And what you're looking at is the spread between the two-year yield and the 10-year. So this line would represent zero. These are recessions in gray. This is right from the St. Louis Fed's website, Fred. And what you're looking at is inversion under this line over here. So when the yield curve inverts, there is a very, very high probability that you are going to see a recession. Over here, right before the COVID crash, it even inverted. You can barely see it. We got the deepest inversion since 1980, I believe, 1981. So this is what happens right before a recession. But one other thing gives you kind of like a heads up. So this is the warning. The heads up is after the yield curve inverts sharp steepening. I'm going to show you another chart. And this is just a closer view of that 210 spread. Here's the inversion, and recently we've been seeing some steepening. Now, what usually causes the steepening is the Fed cutting rates in a normal recessionary environment. We haven't had inflation to deal with in 40 years. We've had a lot of recessions, so it's a little bit different. But that is why the yield curve typically steepens really quick. And after it's inverted, that is the last thing that happens right before a recession. So while the stock market was kind of dull this week, it's been dull the last six weeks, there's some stuff going on in the bond market and Fed fund futures. So on Friday, Fed fund futures, now actually not Friday, a little bit earlier in the week, I think it was Thursday, were somewhere around 40% chance of a 25 basis point cut in July. Now that is gonna move all over the place. You know, if the regional banks sell off, you know, that jumps. But if we look at the end of the year, the Fed is basically saying they're gonna leave rates where they are at a corridor of five to 5.25% for the rest of the year. But if we look at Fed funds futures, what they are saying is there is a six tenths of a percent of that happening, not even 1% chance. They are currently pricing in a 60% chance as of Friday's close that the Fed will have cut by 75 basis points by the December meeting at the end of this year. So the bond market, the Fed fund futures, very different than what the Fed is saying. Why would the Fed cut rates when inflation is still sticky? The recession will bring uh, that inflation down more quickly. But the only reason they would cut rates is we get into a recession that is a lot deeper than expected or what always happens with every Fed rate hike cycle is something breaks. Could that be the regional banks? 
probably. But when something like that breaks, often it spider webs out in like these second order effects to a dozen different areas that nobody ever saw coming. So that is a reason the Fed would cut because the only thing they're more worried about than inflation is a financial crisis. If the plumbing of the financial system breaks down, it doesn't matter what they do. They can't transmit monetary policy through broken plumbing. So when we look at these other markets, right now we're seeing some of the stock market showing uh, an aversion to cyclicals because it's looking a little bit more like we're a little bit more worried about a recession, but we're seeing that in the bond market, Fed funds futures, a lot of different places. So I do believe that we're towards the end of phase one for subscribers, if you know what that is, and going to be moving into phase two shortly. I do still think that the mega caps can probably carry the S&P above 4,200, but some of those changes in character that I'm seeing are very recent. So we have like the Dow Industrials up here in transports in blue. This chart's normalized right over here. So you can see the recent underperformance. Now, a lot of the times the transports will lead the industrials. If you go by old Dow theory, they should confirm, but Dow Industrials are not that industrial anymore. But a lot of places I'm seeing where the leading group or leading groups inside of a sector that are more economically sensitive are acting a lot weaker I just changed this main chart over to the technology sector and I'm going to put in the uh, Philly Semiconductor Index. Semis tend to be more sensitive and they tend to lead the tech sector. So recent changes in character. Again, this chart is normalized as of right here at the left side and you can see relative weakness in the more economically sensitive semis. Now the mega caps tend to be secular growth. So what that would mean is cyclicals like materials, industrials, energy, they do well at the beginning of a new economic cycle or when growth is kind of expanding. When you get into a recession, those stocks don't do well in. You tend to see the secular growth stocks do better. So what would be an example of that? It's usually the mega caps. So are you still going to use Facebook in a recession? Yeah. Are you still going to use Google in a recession? Yeah. There's also, I believe, a flight to quality. So moving out of stuff like the banks and some of the energy and materials and moving into strong balance sheets like, you know, Amazons and Googles and stuff like that. But the point is, these more sensitive sectors are showing recent deterioration. And um, that is one of the changes in character. But you have to look really carefully for these things. I watch it every single day. It's one of the first things I report on in my first post of the cash market. One of my other favorites to watch is high yield credit. Now, high yield credit is very sensitive to yields, but HYG is like a very deep liquid product and a lot of institutional money will use HYG in place of S&P futures. So you have to always keep in mind what rates are doing on that day. But what I have done is created a watch list index of different credit uh, indices and it's like a little bit less noisy than HYG on its own, but HYG is part of it. So let me show you that real quick. Okay, so what we're looking at is the S&P 500 15 minute chart right there in the candlesticks and in white is what I call my leading indicator index. It's basically a half a dozen different kinds of credit. So we're going to roll forward. There's the beginning of the rally in October and you can see the uh, credit index is pretty much confirming. Let me just expand this out a little bit. Actually, it'd be better to do it right here. So we keep moving forward. We come into the new year, still confirming we have a higher high over here in the credit index with the S&P, right? And a little bit of weakness right there. We get a pullback. So you really can get some insights from this even just on an intraday basis often. But let me zoom all the way forward. So. As we've been in this lateral range over here for six weeks and coming off this March low, you can see credit is no longer confirming. It's making a lower high where the S&P is basically about an equal high, right? So this is another change in tone or change in character that is turning a little bit more uh, south or a little bit more negative. And jumping back to 3C, this is that um, Friday I showed you the support at S&P 4100 here. Uh, this is my own indicator. It's basically a money flow indicator. It has the power to contradict prices. I've been using the three minute trend and then the five minute trend as this rally grew a little bit to track 
basically the health of it. So in a market that is performing well, 3C should pretty much track with price. Sometimes it positively diverges like we see over here. That's good. But if we look at this five minute chart, what you can see is the last area we got some really good accumulation was mid-March right here on that dip. And we see that rally that came right up to basically the February highs. And we've been in this like six week lateral trend or lateral consolidation, really dull trade. Part of that was earnings season, but still, I do not like the looks of this. This looks like we're starting to see some distribution, especially after this little kind of breakout failed right above that um, lateral range that we're trading in. Now, QQQ, since Q1 or since January 1st, or January 3rd actually, has been the best. It's had the best looking 3C chart as well. I used the same five minute to track that. And it's been really spectacular. It's held in there great. You can see a positive divergence here, trending up more or less with um, QQQ, 3C. But here we do see a little bit of weakness. This is not something that is sending up like a red flag to me that, hey, we gotta get short tomorrow. But I do think we're seeing some distribution. And I think if we do see the S&P trade over 4,200, I think that we'll see a lot more of it as smart money sells into price strength. They don't wanna sell into price weakness and get filled, you know, they'd be working against themselves. They wanna sell into price strength and that is distribution. This over here is accumulation buying price weakness. So last week, my live stream, if you didn't see it, you can check it out. It was called The Perfect Storm. I see three things converging. We still have sticky inflation. It's still high. It's probably going to moderate a lot more as we go into recession. But then we're going to have inflation that's still high. Recession, you can call that stagflation. And the risk of a financial crisis. The other thing is, and I usually, you know, I don't like fear mongering. A lot of people get on, they'll fear monger and they get a lot of views. They get a lot of likes. I try to be as honest and transparent with my subscribers as I can. I'm not doing them any favors by uh, creating some hysteria around the market, but I do want to show you something. Usually when these debt ceilings come up, it's kind of like a big to do about nothing. All right. I've seen a lot of them and the market gets a little itchy and people are worried and then it just turns out to be nothing. But this one does look different. I'll show you why. So this is US CDS credit default swaps. You can see the 2011 debt ceiling. That's a horrible drawing with that marker. You can see the uh, 2013 debt ceiling, the CDS going up, the risk of a credit event for the US. And over here, it's just mind-boggling high. So the market sees this one as much more serious. So we have the perfect storm, potentially. You have a recession, still sticky inflation, a potential financial crisis. And while I do think that this will probably get resolved in the end, um, they're, I think Yellen was talking about June 1, they might be out of money. But I do think it probably gets resolved I don't know the market escapes it unscathed, and I don't know that the US credit does not, the sovereign credit rating doesn't get downgraded. I think there's a really good chance that that happens. That wouldn't be good for the market either. So potentially four ugly things coming up. In the meantime, we got six weeks of pretty much lateral boring trade, a lot of this earning season, so we can excuse that. But over here, we're starting to see what I think is some distribution, some selling. I still think that the mega caps, because they are so heavily weighted, can pull the S&P above 4,200. What that would do on a trend basis, um, let's go to a daily chart, I'm gonna have to zoom in a little bit. What that would do on a trend basis is give us a higher high. So we have, let me just grab a pen real quick. So going from that October low, what we have is a intermediate trend, bullish trend, because the market is making higher highs and higher lows, right? Until we get right here. We don't have that higher high. Above 4,200, we do have that higher high. I think what will happen is a lot of people that didn't see this rally, that didn't participate, that were still bearish because we were in a bear market until this point. We're in an intermediate lateral trend in most of the indices. But I think what you'll see is some FOMO, some retail chasing, maybe some hedge funds. Uh, chasing 
my most shorted index is at the lowest level it's been since the end of the 2020 uh, COVID crash. So there's a potential for some short squeeze driving the market higher. But I do believe that if we do get over 4,200, and this is just my thesis, you know, we have to watch what actually happens if that happens. But I do think that we will see selling into that strength by smart money as we get into some heavier um, resistance levels and as we move from phase one. Oh, aren't we glad the Fed is about done tightening right here? This is kind of by the uh, by the rumor, sell the news kind of thing. And as we move into phase two, which is the market starts to get more worried about the economic recession. We're seeing that in weakness in cyclicals, stuff like semiconductors, transports recently, all that kind of stuff. Those are the changes in character that lead to changes in trend. So I hope you found this video helpful. I hope it wasn't too long. We'll see. <laughs> and uh, check out the website. Remember what I told you, you can uh, subscribe now at rates from 2008, but when the new website goes live with the trading room and all that stuff, they're going to go up a little bit. Hope everybody has a fantastic weekend. Thanks for watching. If you like the video, please subscribe and also hit the bell for notifications. I do live streams a lot, so you'll be notified about those. Thank you. Everybody have a fantastic weekend.